No problem. I'm just working out. I'm, I'm trying to get my thoughts. We're trying to talk about the weird. She's waving the weird around in her arms. It's quite oh, fine. Waving the weird. It's all right. These, these, are, these are weird, weird, weirds. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, you've all got this. We are going to talk about the weird, I think. Yeah. Weird, weird woman. Get on it. <laughs> How do you want to spell that? Um, w Y R D, please. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave the other bit. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I've been working on the the advanced runes course this morning, so my head is absolutely stuffed full of how the runes and the weird interact. So that's what we've got to talk about. So we, we can talk about that. Yes. Um, you know, it, it really comes from the fact that most rune courses will only talk about runes as divination. And of course they are not. That's only half the story. If half the story, isn't it? It, it might be as much as half. It might be mm. less than half. Yeah, exactly. But it's only a part of the whole. But everyone gets hooked up on, oh, you can tell fortunes. You can tell the future. Yes, you can. Or you can tell a future, to be accurate. Because the future is not yet set in stone. Everybody wants to know their future because they want to set it in stone. Yes, which is the other part of it or an other part of it even. Mm. And, and this is where the advanced room course is going. The introductory room courses I run are pretty much simple. Here are the rooms, here's some meanings, work out some more meanings, see how they relate to you, see how you relate to them. Here's a quick nodding reference to some of the deities who, who work with the rooms. And some of um, the saga -y things, what do you call them? There are, there are some mentions in the sagas. There's mm. oh, two references in Roman writers. Mm. Very briefly. Yeah, but they're Rupert Murdoch of their age. <laughs> very, very vague and bland about, you know. And oh, they didn't I really know what the fuck they were talking about, about anyway. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's quite a, a superficial dash through. And, and I've yes, just I done it. Um, I will say it's well worth it. It's, it's um, well and you... Yet work with them don't try and memorize and learn off um the basic information that fiona will also give you in there work with oh, no, the things yourself and see what they actually say to you and see what the lines from the sagas say to you because that's really fun you do have to forge your own relationship with the rooms otherwise it's you might as well do it with chess pieces so, no idea. I've never actually divined with chess pieces. I must try that. <laughs> it's a bit like it's a bit like the people who get a book of uh, you know a pack of tarot cards, uh, and you're supposed to lay them out like that, and then you go through the little notes. And, oh, that means this. This is going to happen. Well, of course it doesn't, mm. because you haven't forged the relationship. Mm. Yeah. In the same way as you're working with any divination tool, you have to forge that relationship. You have to make those connections. Mm. And as soon as you start talking about connections, you start talking about the weird. Absolutely. But the weird, it's very difficult to, to describe the weird in English. We don't have the words for it. You can think of it as a web, like a spider's web. Well, that's how I always do think of it. You can think of it as a weaving because the Norns who govern the weird, the three goddesses of fate, mm. who are so, so old, mm. they predate practically every other god and goddess in the entire Indo-European pantheon. Because you find them in... Everywhere. Every culture. Yeah, everywhere. They are textile goddesses. They spin and they weave. And they are, I think, in most of them. They are in every single one I can find. And what they do for me, if I can just do a little diagram here, is... Um, Get in there, get in there, guys. Hang in there, don't go away. We're all right, really. Swift scribbles going on. Yeah, soft scribble now. Tell me when I'm in, in, in view here. Upper, middle and lower, yes. They oh, always have them like that as well. They're also the past, the future, and then the present. Yeah, and every, every possible threeness you can think of. Yes. Uh, uh, in, but the point is, they are always to do with weaving and spinning. Yeah. So the weird is fabric. It's a net, or it's a web, or it's a huge tapestry. But the, the, 
one of the biggest problems is we can't get our limited little human brains around it. But we do have a little helper here. I shall have to do this with Barnes. You have helpers. Yes. The little helper for me is the mycorrhiza. Yes. Absolutely. And so there's all the threads of the weird, and yes. they all connect up all yes. over the place, and they cover the whole. Well, they should. They don't anymore, but they should cover the whole globe. Absolutely. And they connect all the different kingdoms and types of life. Uh, that is the weird, but that's not something that's very easy to carry in a little human brain. It's not so bad if you think about those mushroom things. It's not too bad if you think about mushroom things, but then when you start working with it, and you start spreading it out and getting bigger. <laughs> you can't see all of it at once. You can't see all the ramifications. Yeah. <clears throat> and in fact, if you, if you read the sagas, you realise that even the Norse gods get it quite spectacularly wrong at a lot of times. Especially the later jobs. <laughs> Especially the later jobs, but I'm, I'm particularly thinking of, of Freya and Balder. Oh my God, don't they just? Oh. She, is, she has this most beautiful little baby boy. Never mind the blind twin that, you know, yeah. not interested in that. Yeah. Which is very non-PC these days. But she is so determined to protect her beautiful baby boy from absolutely everything. That she runs around making everything on the planet swear never to hurt him. Yeah. Well, you can see where that's going straight off, can't you? <sighs> yeah, she misses somebody. And but uh, naturally, this preternaturally beautiful little boy is going to die early. And he does. And one of my favourite of them, I think, is the one who actually does it. Well, he doesn't do it. He, he facilitates somebody else doing it, shall we yes. say. This is true. This, which is With mistletoe, if I remember that's rightly. That's right. Yeah. The one thing on earth that didn't promise not to hurt Boulder was a little sprig of mistletoe. And Freya overlooked it because it was just a baby and it was too small. <laughs> Silly cow. <laughs> so Loki, of course, finds this one thing and goes, aha. And he makes a dart out of it. And then he goes along. And this is the really silly bit. This is where hubris really ticks in, kicks in. Balder is celebrating his birthday, typical teenage male, by saying, nobody can hurt me, throw anything you want at me. I can take it. So Loki puts the sp sprig of mistletoe into his twin brother's hand. This is the blind twin, Oda. And he says, don't you want to join in with throwing things at your brother? And he says, yeah, I have nothing to throw and I can't see anyway. And he says, don't worry. Here's something to throw. Let me point you. He's just that way. Now you throw it right ahead of you. Right now you'll get him. And of course it does. And down he drops dead. <laughs> this is absolutely what happens when you get weird around the back of your neck. Yeah. Yeah. And when you try to make things happen because yeah. you personally want it. And Freya just does that the whole time. I've never seen anybody who purports to be a goddess be so bloody person-centered and self-centered in my life. Well, yeah, this is true. <laughs> but, you know, in the bigger picture, which Freya was not looking at, and, and again, this is what weird does, it's always bigger than you thought. The reason Balder has to die is because until he's dead, he can't come back to be the next king after Ragnarok. Yeah. Exactly. So he has to die young and beautiful. And, and by trying to protect her little darling, she's balling up the whole plan. Absolutely. <laughs> so have to get straightened out. And that's something else that tricks the gods do so well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But yes. there is another aspect to this. There's always another aspect to it when you're thinking about the weird. And that is that the weird is, like the norns, so very, very old. And it is every life ever lived, every connection ever made. So it probably predates the planet. I would say it's part of string theory. Yes, almost certainly. Which means it probably predates the universe even. Or at least is all involved in the same thing if the universe ever had a beginning anyway, which I don't really, well, this is I'm not really convinced about. <laughs> Another point where my little limited human imagination goes, I can't think like that. But 
as soon as you start looking at that, you think, well, of course it would be Loki. He's a Jotun. Yes. Jotuns are the oldest. I love Jotuns. I love Jotuns. <laughs> the oldest deities. And in fact, they're so old as deities that most people forget they are deities. Yeah. They're just giants. Oh. They, you know, yeah, you can write them off as just giants. Most so people do. Some person. But they, they are the elemental forces of nature. Yeah. They are creation and destruction. And each one is creation and destruction. Yes. There isn't this one for creation and that one for destruction. Exactly. And um, that goes for every bloody tradition yeah. in the world. Yes. Of all, the, of all the deities who managed to get it around the back of their necks, actually, I can't think of a time when the Jotuns do the Jotna. No, I can't either. Or Even any of the really, really, if you really go back to the yeah. really old ones, they don't. Sometimes the later stories, I mean, in um, my tradition, the deer trods um, mm. stuff, which I know you know as well and do, but sometimes you get the sort of like the Victorian stories and they make out, they rewrite them to suit themselves. And they make out that the um, Bladias was a bitch and got it round the back of the neck and was unfaithful. Um, for instance, and then you sort of dive back in and you go, oh, no, 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 not at all. Or Gwydion screwed up and he was a nasty bastard who was, was tricking people. No, 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 no. There's always a deeper purpose. There is, there is. And I think the same thing runs with the Jotun. Oh, it does. Yes. Yes. So when you, when you start working with the weird, you have to first learn something about text -based. Because it's very like all our textile arts in some ways. And I think you can start off with the more common ones these days, like knitting and braiding and knotting and netting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And weaving, of course. But sometimes for me, the one that really makes sense is Sprang. Have you met Sprang? Sprang is a... No well, these days it's seen as a, a, a Norwegian textile art form, but I think it's probably older. Mm. Um, rather than having your threads attached top and bottom and then weaving another one through it that way, yeah, yeah, you attach all the threads top to bottom, and then ah. you begin to twist them one over another. Ah, uh, yeah. So it's almost like finger knitting. Yeah. You will end up with a symmetrical pattern with a locking thread through the middle. Otherwise, it just unwinds itself. But it's that sensation of putting your fingers in and twisting. And do you remember this kiddies game? Yes. Cat's Cradle. Cat's Cradle. It's very like that as well. Yeah, that was immediately yeah. what came to me because I used mm. to play it for hours. I loved it. And um, I got an aunt who would play it with me and my dad would play it with me. And you, you just, you know, da 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 and you, and you literally turn your hands in yes. that way yes. and, and it comes up and then you put it on the other person's hands and then da, 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 and then they turn it in and put it on your hands and you take oh. it back again. And do you see that sharing thing? Yes. But also it, it, this, is, this is a great way to start manipulating the weird. Because when you, once you've learned to, to once you've learned to actually perceive the weird in whatever way it comes to you. And I say that because some people will say it's cold wind. Some people will say, oh, it's his net or it's a web or it's a huge tapestry or however it is for you is right for you. Mm. And once you've seen it or felt it, then you can start to go, ah, now that thread Oh, that thread goes all the way back to my mother and her mother and her mother. And, and you can go back in time. Mm. Ignore the dog, she just can't sort the duvet out. <laughs> and then you start has gone up, she's not in bed, honest. <laughs> <laughs> the dogs are in bed. And then you start working with it a bit more. And you, you can see how threads go through from one life to another. Mm. Yeah. And you can trace not only physical threads that will take you through your genetic ancestry, but ones that will take you through your spiritual ancestry, through your previous incarnations, 
through the incarnations of those who are currently sharing your incarnation. And it becomes a three-dimensional thing. And at some point, you're going to go, hang on a minute, that thread goes where I don't want it to. I'm going to move it. Um, or else you're going to say, that thread goes where I don't want it to. Damn, that means I'm going to have to follow it. There is that as well. <laughs> you, can also, you can also say, well, I don't really like where that, that thread is going, but I can see it's going to have to. Or you can go, I don't like where that thread is going. I can see I can change things in my life now that may help that thread go in a different direction. And now you're weird walking. Now um, you're working with the weird. Indeed you are. And, and the rooms come in again because you can use the rooms to change your perception or to change circumstances to encourage the weird to weave itself in a different pattern. Does that come through um, a negotiating process with the said rune? It has to. Mm. Because you can't know it all for yourself. And you, you always can't... have to go, hang on, will this work? Will it work the way I'd like it to work? Will it work in a good way, even if it's not the way I think I want it to work? Is it the right thing to do? And what are the consequences? So before you start pulling on the threads, it's awfully tempting just to go, oh, I can see that. Wow. But don't do it. <laughs> You'll end up with kitten litty. <laughs> so there's always a process of looking at the runes, of using the runes to divine, and I use the word carefully there, to divine how you got there? Where is here anyway? Yes. Now, how should I best get out of this? Mm. And, and there's possibly also... even further, how should I get out of this to help the whole weird, not just me? Yes. And there always has to be this negotiation that goes, I can see so much, but I can't see it all. Mm. And at that point you go, right, is this the best thing for me to do? Mm. Yeah. And not just best for me, but best for everything. Yeah. Best for the past, for the future, for the present. Yeah. And all of that, the rooms can help you do. Mm. I tend to use yeah, the word mean, appropriate. Mm. Yes. Is this the appropriate course of action? Yeah. It's sort of or order than best. To it. Yeah. yeah. Because there may be several appropriate ways, but which one's best? So you sort of refine it in. Yes. Now that's all part of divining. Which says, what happened? Where am I? Where do I go? Mm. And then you can start using the runes to make a positive change. Yeah. yeah. And that's where runic magic comes in, because now you're using the runes to create something different. Yeah. Not just to see what's here, mm. but to go, let's steer it a little bit. Mm. And that's where the advanced rune course goes. Yeah. It goes more into the magic. When you were saying something just now um, about the threads and them all going in different directions, mm. I mean, the word that came to my head then was multiverse. Yes. Yes. Because they, they don't just reach into our universe. Oh, no, no, no. They, it, is, it is very much life, the universe and everything. Mm. So all you scientists guys, you know, you want your gut. <laughs> um, translate that for me. Uh, grand universal grand unifying theory. That's right. Grand unifying theory. Gut. Yes. That's what gut means. Yes. And um, so if you want that, get in the weird guys. But really seriously, because yes. they're getting more and more into it all the time, aren't they? Absolutely, yes. I, I think it's it was, it, I had a bit of an epiphany late last night as I was writing up some notes for this, this course. Which happens when you're doing any course, you, you're busy going along thinking, yes, 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 I know all this, I can teach. Oh, that was new. <laughs> <laughs> this happens. You know, and suddenly you find yourself rewriting something you've been teaching for the past 20 years. Yeah. Which you know perfectly well, and I know you know that. <laughs> but this I've just given up course. trying to think that I've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> there is something that humans do the other animals don't. And that is representational art. Other animals do beautiful art. But when you look at it, 
it doesn't communicate to humans. We're very good. No, but maybe it does communicate to everything that isn't human. It may, though, having said that, I've never seen a cat look twice at a painting by another cat. Um, I have, actually. Right, then you see more than me about cats. Yeah. Well, I've had cats yes. more recently than you, so, yeah. you know. I know you, elephants have been taught to draw elephants, but there's quite a lot of evidence that they, they draw what they've been taught to draw in yeah. return for a, a reward from a human. Yeah, they yeah, don't exactly. Keep, you know, give them a paintbrush and turn them loose with the wall. They do not draw elephants. Mm -hmm. They put the paintbrush off, down and go off and find some food, mm. which is very sensible. But as long as humans have been humans, we've been creating art by altering our environment. There's evidence of ochre being picked up and changed to change the color by, by Homo erectus. Yeah. And that's going back, what, half a million years. Yeah. yeah. And then there's they the think even, They think even further with some of the things. Well, yes. And that, that woman's book that I, I gave yes. the other day. Yeah. Uh, that, goes back two million years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something that we've been doing as a species for a long time. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start looking at that, you realize that we do have an innate tendency to go, here are some symbols that will carry a, an abstract meaning to another human. Yeah. Whether it's a handprint on a wall in a cave, or it's a script that we look at and go, well, I, I can see it's deliberate, it's not a doodle, but I don't know what it means. Mm. I'm thinking of the Vinca script here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you start getting into the origins of actual writing. Which seem to be just going further and further and further and further back. Yes, but they seem to start with, I'm going to draw a duck. And when I draw a duck, it means a duck. And then you go, well, hang on a minute. The word duck is really duh and a k. So ignore k. That pain painting of a of duck means duh. And the next thing you know, you, you're writing Dumbo by combining a duck with two other things mm. to make um, bow. So, in and a sense, we compress things we down. We compress the information down. Hmm. That's uh, also putting up a whole load of sort of, ooh, careful. Yes. For me. Yes. Because that's bringing things that can be bringing things down to a box you can actually handle. We, we bring it down to a box that we can handle, but we also conventionalize it. Yeah. All right, did you know the letter A, our, our normal letter A that you write as a capital A? You know, the dunk, dunk, dunk. Yeah. It's a drawing of a cow's head. No. If you look at where our alphabet came from, it came from the Phoenician alphabet. Yes. Yeah. And if you look at how the Phoenician alphabet developed, it developed from the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Yes. Now, the word for an ox or a cow in Phoenician was Alep, hence A. Mm. And they picked that shape up from Egyptian hieroglyphs where you draw a cow's head. So you've got a cow's head with an ear. And there's the back of the jaw. <laughs> and then you turn it on its side and you've got a cow's head with a jaw. And then you conventionalize it and you've got the modern letter A. So it's been taken away from its origins. Yeah. It no longer says, here is a cow. Mm. And it's been moved into completely other languages. And now it says, this is A. Ah. And what we do with the weird is we go the other way. Yes. Yeah. Open the box and unfold all those layers of fabric inside. Yeah. yeah. Let it go free. Yeah. 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 And that in turn turns our idea of where we stand in the world upside down. Because when you've put everything in a box, you can sit on the box and go, hey, I'm great. <laughs> I am the master of the universe. Oh, you can stand on the box and shout it. Yes. Hmm. And that's so, what we do as a species. We are, you know, hugely evolved. We've got this magnificent brain and you know where I'm going. Yes, I can see in your face what you think of that one. But when you open that box and let everything out, we're one thread in an absolutely vast tapestry. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And every other living thing has an equally valid, beautiful thread in that same tapestry. 
and that really stretches out to stars, supernovas, other planets, gas clouds, everything. And every particle in a gas cloud has a thread. Yes. Um, it's, I mean, the weed is so like the deer trods for me. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I'm just used to the deer trods. You're used to the, the weird. They but are actually the same thing. They seem to be, don't they? Yes. Mm. I mean, both, both the deer trods from the Celtic tradition and the weird from the Norse tradition stem from the same roots. Yeah. The three goddesses who predate all Indo European cultures. And I'd even say the three powers. Yes. And I'm not even sure that I would always give them a gender. I think that one has been attached because weaving and spinning is women's work. Exactly. My thoughts too. Except, of course, when you're doing a feral sweater. I, re I regard the invention of knitting by Norse men, and I use the word deliberately there, mm. as merely redressing the gender imbalance. But it's just one of those little things that makes me sort of laugh, you know, because and I, I love fair art. <clears throat> I can't do it, but I love it. And um, you think, no, it, it's it's the fishermen did that, and they're the descendants of the Norse people. Yes, that's up where the fair art is. Yes, and um, and it's, it's blokes sitting there knitting. Absolutely. And there are some very old photographs of them on the quay just doing yeah. that. So well, I'm not Shetland boys and men used to knit. Yeah. Yes. And um, indeed, there is evidence that the Viking warriors... There needed. is. Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. But if anyone ever asks, what did the Vikings do for the world? They invented knitting. knitting. <laughs> <laughs> Most brilliant thing they ever did, I think. But that does make me also hook back towards the weird, because although mm. since the, the Stone Age, probably, mm. men have gone out and chased large animals around the landscape and tried to get dinner home that way. And women have processed the results, collected all that woolly mammoth hair, collected all the plant fibers for food, and have processed it to make string and nets and textiles and woven the sails of Viking ships and things like that. But, I'm just pausing a moment here to catch that thread that's disappearing of where I was, where I was going with this. <laughs> there, is, there is no inherent reason why men can't knit and weave. No. Just as when you actually look back at um, the Australian native people, mm. quite often it's the women who go hunting. Yes. And they're well, better, they're better hunters and trackers. So they can't run as fast, but they can run longer, for instance. Yes. Which, if you're a persistence hunter, is what counts. Well, you look at most predators, an awful lot of it is about persistence. Mm. You know, you don't get your wildebeest immediately. You don't get your um, no. buffalo or something immediately if you're a wolf pack. You, it, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that our modern gender stereotypes are very yeah. modern indeed. Very modern. Viking warrior women. There are Saxon warrior women. Yeah, there are. Uh, Led battles. Well you know, Saxon queens have led battles, one just up the road from me. Absolutely. So the, the modern the modern modern gender stereotypes don't really have any meaning when you push them back. No, they're not that's why really perhaps more, much more than a thousand years old. Probably not. Well, they really came in with the Normans because before there, then, there are women had loads of yes things which they didn't have after. There are physical differences between men and women that Absolutely. do tend to make men more likely to take risks and hunt things and women more likely to sit at home with the babies? Maybe. Most of the time, perhaps. I think one of the things is sort of like, men have a lot more upper body strength because of the way yes. they're built. Yes. So they can do things which is much harder for a woman because her body yes. isn't built like that sort of thing. So the point is to make your society work, you need a balance, you need both. Yeah, yeah. And they conference that I'm always on about uh, 1967 in Chicago the um, it was called man the hunter but the, the tongue was sticking out of the bloody ear let alone the cheek in that because it was a, um, a conference that went deeply into 
the hunter-gatherer peoples that were left, and of course there were a lot more left in 1967 than there were than there are now. And every time they went in there, there was no gender imbalance like we modern idiots have at no. all. If you were good at that, that's what you did. Yeah. It didn't matter whether you got dangly bits at the bottom or dangly bits at the top. No, and to a large extent, you did what you wanted. Yep. There are tendencies. And curiously enough, the fact that women have a waist, more of a waist and more of a hip than men, tends to make it easier for a baby to sit on it. And it also makes it easier for the baby to come out because there's actually a place yeah. for the baby to get in in the first place and grow. Yes. Um, men just, I mean, can you imagine? Toothpaste. Yeah, <laughs> no, let's yeah. not go there. <laughs> but I think that is, as you say, I think that is why the norms are perceived as goddesses. Yeah, I do too. And I think it's but quite I think amazing. if we went far enough back, I think, I think you're right to say they would simply be powers without gender. I think so. And I'm just trying to find something here, which I find really helpful. I'm sure it's in this one. God knows where I've put the blood. Oh, I've got it right here. Now, is that a man or a woman? I would have to say yes. Hmm. Same here. I would also say that there are, in, in the surviving Norse myths, which we have, which talk about the weird, and people who work with the weird, there are some quite strong indications that it was seen as gender bending. In as much as you had gender stereotype, stereotypes, mm. a man who performed weird magic tended to be seen as a little bit unmanly. When about was that? He's looking around about the Around about 500 through to probably about 1000 AD. Yeah, so it's, so it's early really recent. Long. So take that back a bit further and think, okay, so in a, a quite a highly gendered society, mm. they saw my working magic as a bit unmanly. Mm. So take that back and think, well, okay, predate the division between man and woman, predate gender roles. Mm. And what you've got is something that is, I'm not sure that gender fluid is the right word. I'm trying to do it. But it transcends gender. I mean, it's neither and both. Yes. And that's where we come back to the Jotna. Because one of the big themes that runs through Norse mythology with the Jotna is that they are gender benders. Yeah. I mean, Loki, who is normally seen as a male god, gave birth to a foal. Yeah, and, and he, quite he turned himself into, himself, himself into a rather beautiful mare. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, magic transcends gender stereotypes. It does a bit, and you've got to sort of like read between the lines if you're only into the Victorian stories. It does a bit with Gwydion. Yes. You know, you go... And the, certainly the story of um, when they upset math by actually helping out, helping somebody out yeah. um, and, and taking his beautiful little virgin away from him. <laughs> um, they, they turned into pairs of beasts. Yes, one male, one female. And they had to produce children. Matt, Matt then proceeded to nick all the kids, mind you, typical. And um, not exactly one of the best. But um, they they were they were definitely both, mm. and I, I, occurs in other stories too. So, yes. and I can't remember the name. Um, the the witch woman who does side. Yes, uh, can't remember what they called. The vulva or the spackle. That's it. The vulva. Yeah. Spellwife in Scotland. Yes. Yes. And and that is wife um you've got to get right down into what wife means and that's a hell of a lot more than you know ring on finger job um but there there's sort of become a gendery thing that it's female but they weren't but they weren't always female no and you get over into um siberia and all around there and even at the northern um nordic countries you know, Finland and that, 
and you find it that no and it's the man and again you know you sort of look at this and you think oh it's a skirt therefore it's a skirt well no it could be a robe. But it isn't would you see they gendered it yeah yeah and also i mean if you're wearing clothes like that actually it's like quite nice and warm and comfortable and you can actually co coil yourself up under something and go to sleep in it well um, you're talking to someone who lives in scotland home of the kilt exactly. which is an article of male attire yeah yeah yes so and, so it really this, this it? wandered quite away from starting off with the weird well i don't know but it, it's it's telling us about the weird it is, it is after all everything so yeah. you know there aren't any boundaries <laughs> we can get away with that one it, it is such a big subject and i'm really enjoying coming back to it and reviewing what i've written before and having little epiphanies and thinking aha and one of the things we really need to do in this century, if not earlier, is to get away from the idea that we are superior and to acknowledge that every other thing in the universe has as much right to life, existence and the pursuit of happiness as we do. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And it isn't there for us to use. No. You know, we're, we're, we're not this God-given title that can go and, you know, use everything. And that, one, that one, I have to say, I blame on the Romans, not on the, not on the Normans. Um, yes, I basically blame it on the Christians, where, where, whatever race they were. <laughs> well, no, it, it, pagan pagan pre-Christian Romans also had the idea that land was a commodity. You buy it and sell it. Yeah, the Romans did, yeah, yeah, they yeah. did. They're very weird. Well, and it's quite possible the Christians picked it up from them. You can't Because tell. the Jews did not regard land as a commodity. Land was divinely given. It was... And again, they have the guardianship yes. thing. That, you know, you didn't own it. You were guardian to it. Mm. And um, as most of the old traditions do. Yes. Um, and I don't know, does that come into the weird as well? That you are guardian to things? I think it does, yes, because everything is it pre-Christian Germanic tradition is animist. Mm, yeah. Everything has awareness. Yeah. 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 I notice I'm losing my tenses. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> if you only regard time as linear, then it was animist. If you don't regard time as linear, it is animist. Yeah. And to me, the is is what it is. I mean, there's a, um, a lovely bit in um, Terry Windling's The Woodwife, mm. which actually, tell, uh, this is comes from the Navajo tradition, but I've seen it in other traditions as well, and it's certainly in ours, that, you know, when you're a baby, um, you've got linear, sort of like that again, you know, you go from here to here to here. Yes. And there's lots of um, relatively recent stuff that says, you know, time is a string of pearls and, and that one and that sort of thing. You go pearl, 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 sort of thing. And then it happens that people start thinking, oh, it's circular. You go round and round and round and round. And that sort of works for a little while until you start realising there are various sort of hang ups with that and it doesn't work. And then you start getting spiral. Yes. And if you actually look at how the gal our galaxy, for instance, travels through space, it doesn't go round and round. It goes on a spiral. And everything spirals on it. And the whole thing goes like that. It's, yeah. it's like, whoa. You know, when I learned that bit of physics, it was like, bing. You yes. know. And so... If you can think, for me, it's like trying to think of that spider's web as a three-dimensional spiral thing. Yes. As well. Which uh, I, does blow my mind a bit, that one. Well, it does, yes. I'm, I'm always a little wary of spider's webs because I'm not sure I'm the spider. No, I'm very keen on spiders, so I like them. I don't have a problem with spiders in that sense. I would just like to know that whether I'm the spider or the fly. Oh, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then I'm a predator, you know that. <laughs> it, it does, it does um, how can I put it, it does make you walk a little warily when you're wandering happily through this web thinking, this is great, I'm a spider, and then you realise there's a bigger spider going, ah, dinner. 
Yes, going um, shilob. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm no, no, I'm, I haven't I'm got my sword. Of the imagery for the for the weird. I none of them are accurate representations. No, they're not. But as you said earlier, it doesn't really matter, and your concept will change. I mean, mine has um, over the years. Yes. Of how you actually see something, and you'll have a. A little concept for a while and then it will grow and change and turn into something else and that's what as it should hmm. and the other thing to remember is that that's yours it's not anyone else's you really have to work pretty darn hard to be wrong when it's your relationship to something yeah it's possible, it's possible. um you, have to work but, at it. um it, you know yeah, and that sort of takes you into the other thing that, you know, if you, you're, you're there doing the advanced rooms course sort of thing, or the basic rooms course come to that, mm. probably even more so than that. Um, and somebody comes along and tells you, oh, but, it, you know, that doesn't mean this. ISO doesn't mean that. It means this, 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 and this. And, and basically, you know, I'll get your fist going and go, bonk, no, it doesn't. It really is a case of this is my world and they know me here. Oh, little anecdote. Yes. Which stunned stunned me at the time. This happened oh, over 30 years ago. Um, yeah, I was still here. Um, anyway, I was on the uh, psychology training that I did, the transpersonal. And part of the training was um, we were taken on a journey. I mean, there's quite a lot of journeying in the transpersonal. And my God, it really works. But they don't call it that. It doesn't matter. Anyway, we're all taken on our journey and we had to draw our journey afterwards. And then we got into groups of four and we told the story of our journey. <clears throat> and everybody else listened and afterwards then they could make any comments they wanted. Well, <clears throat> mine ended up being um, down into a cave and there uh, where I found a cup and up onto a mountain where I found a sword. And the, the mountain was made out of two dragon skeletons that were going like this. So I came out of this thing going, oh, fuck. Yes. You know, I've got, to, I've got to do this in front of a pack of cretins who have never heard of this and just think it's Arthurian twaddle. And um, so other world said, yes, you have. Get on it. <laughs> so I got on it. <clears throat> and it, believe it, the colours had to be pink and purple and blue. You know, it's... Oh. And anyway, there I was and I did it. And um, actually there was a girl with me and we became very, very good friends afterwards and she was okay. But there were two blokes there and they were ripping it to shreds and all this sort of thing. And then the tutor came over. So tutor would always come over to your group and sort of check how things were going. And he sort of said, well, actually I, it looks totally ungrounded to me, Ellen. Um, there, there are no browns and reds and things like that in it. It's all the high dark, high colors like that. And he was sort of ripping it to shreds, by which time I got pissed. Um, but I'd also, my, it was the first time my bottle really came up. And I really got my bottle together. So I just looked at him and he was six foot four and good looking and very handsome and very knowledgeable and kind and all this sort of thing. I just looked at him and I said, Ian, that may be your reality, but this is mine. End of story, you thought. So anyway, the blokes went around and did their bit. And then just before we were all supposed to come back into the main group, Ian, the tutor, comes galloping over. Can you imagine this six foot four? Anyway, galloping across the room and says, whoa, whoa, I have to, I've got something to say. I've got something to say. Ellen, he said, I'm really sorry. You were right and I was wrong. And I was just like, you could have blown me over with a feather. Because hmm. my authority figure had given me my authority. Yes. And... You've got to do that. You've got to say, no, this is my reality. I see it like a spider's web. I don't care for you. I know if you don't like spider's webs and you're worried about flies, mine is a spider's web. Absolutely. And you go, great. <laughs> so you really do have to hang on to it and you have to hang on to what's yours because you can't be somebody else. No, it doesn't work. No. The weird is not a place where you can lie and faff and pull the wool over your own eyes, let alone anyone else's. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. You have to be absolutely clear and honest with yourself, and that's the hardest thing. Yeah. But you also have to be absolutely certain that this is your reality. Yeah. Yeah. 
And who do you check that out with then? Well, you, you have to check with yourself off. because it's no use asking anyone else. Except you can get some from the norms. You can get some feedback from the norms. They have a habit to go, well, I would like to know what you think about that. Well, yes, but that actually helps you because you yeah. end up being in this sort of conversation. Yes. Any and, of the, and the Jotun, I would have thought, too. I mean, I can just imagine tricks. having a chat with Loki. Yes. Any of the tricks to gods will do you a very good turn there. Because they'll hold up a non-reflecting correct mirror and go, what do you think? Yeah. Yes. And you and do the other have place, to do it. The other place I would actually go for to check that would be the runes themselves. Yes. And see what actually turns up for you. It's like I, I use the cards instead of the runes. Yes. And so if I'm really sort of unsorted, it's this simple, and I think yours is this simple too. Just take the pack sort of like this, and um, and I sort of go like this and sort of say, okay, show me, show me what I need to know is what I usually do. And I just open and look at the first one. Yes. And that will be my answer, even if I don't understand it yet. I just have to work with it. And you do the same thing with the rooms. You throw them on the bowl, stir them around, pull one out and go, oh. Don't understand what? It, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> and I get, this is something that happens very often with me at the moment because I've been working with, it, we're gonna get a little esoteric here. I work quite a bit with what are called wild rooms. Mm. And these are rooms that are not categorized. They may not even be human rooms. Mm. I was very confused one time when I intercepted a fish room. I assume it was a fish room. It may have been some other aquatic animal or plant because it was a definitely a very watery feeling. Mm. Mm. But when, I, when I'm working with those, I will go into the weird. I will alter my state of consciousness, go into the weird. Very often when I'm just lying down to go to sleep, I'll think, like, okay, show me, show me something now. Yeah. yeah. And this is where it, it becomes quite classical in a sense because I will get all the uh, all the imagery that you the abstract imagery that the shamans report across the world, mm -hmm. the cross hatches, mm -hmm. the wavy lines, the, the branching lines, the dots that not hand prints, admittedly. <laughs> all all the non animal motifs you see in, in cave art yes. will turn up in front of my eyes as I'm lying there with my eyes shut. Yeah, and then a rune will just drift across. Oh, ah, catch that room. Mm. And I may have to hunt it through my dreams. Or mm. it may be like, yeah. I'm here, you've seen me, now I'm off. Yeah. And, and then I have often to... it comes like this to me as well. And very often when you're working with the weird, the runes will be there. Mm. And when you see them there, even if you don't understand them, even if you've never seen them, that particular sign before, mm. make a note of it because it is relevant somehow. Yeah, it will be. Yeah. And if you sit with it, and think with it and ask it, it will, it will explain itself to you. So it's a little bit like, um, again, with the deer trods, the last person you ask is a human or your teacher. Yes. <laughs> so if you on the deer trods will, will actually know. What do you think? Yeah. Well, it's sort of like, well, and uh, as my dad always used to say, that depends. Yes. <laughs> and so, and, or I don't know. Um, sometimes I might sort of say, I got a feel of so-and-so, but that could be me. The trouble is if, you, if your teacher says, um, I feel it's so-and-so, you tend to go, oh, good, I've got an answer. Yes. But that's their answer. It's, it's not yours. Right. It's not yours. You know, it's talking to me. So, yeah, you have to go I, into I, other I, world. I did a while ago have a rune turn up as I was doing one of these scrying sessions. And it turns out it's a horse rune. And I went outside and showed it to the horses. Uh, and Poppy was quite offended. <laughs> I'm not speaking to you. Turned out I'd, I'd used it wrong. Well, <laughs> has explained that to me gently after a couple of days when I've been trying to get back on Poppy's good side. <laughs> so what did you actually said when you put this rune down? Well, I didn't put it down. I, I made the sign in the air with my hand. Yeah. Uh, the sign as I saw it was, it was like a, almost like a, a bracket, but 
horizontal like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if I was a horse, how would I make that? Well, I'd take my front foot and I'd go like that. So that's what I did. And apparently that was rather rude and shouty. <laughs> but basically what it means is I'm very cross with you and I want you to go away. Up yours then. It's really, yes. really right. <laughs> and I, I have seen the horses use it to, them, to each other. Mm. It's very similar to the room for impatience. Yeah. Which again is the foreleg like this, but there are slight differences to the, exactly how you hold your head in your ears. And it's it's not nearly so easy <laughs> with horse rooms as it is with human rooms because we've, we've got them conventionalized and boxed down. Mm. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the rooms that animals use, and they, they do use them, mm. are much bigger and wilder. Yeah. And sometimes they involve the whole body. Mm. There is a room for being startled amongst birds. And it basically is an explosion of feathers in all directions. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. fling your head up and you fling your wings out and you throw your legs out and you leap in the air. And that means gosh. I mean, I'll just say gosh. I'm not very good at leaping the air, but I can no, press. It, it's, <laughs> it's, a room, it, it's a sign that communicates surprise, intense surprise. I mean, in, in modern English, we'd probably do three exclamation marks. If you're a bird, you do this in all directions. Mm. If you're a horse, then you throw both front feet out in front of you mm. and throw your head back. You can't write them down in that sense because they're not written in human languages. No, no. They're written in body language. Body language and thought. Mm. Mm. Yeah, when I, when I stopped defending Poppy quite so much and she got over it and I'd apologized enough, we, we worked on it together and it, uh, I now know that when you do it like that, you're supposed to put your head down more. I found the same thing when I go out for walks. And yes. I <clears throat> meet more birds usually, but not always than animals. And we've got badgers and foxes and mice and voles and all sorts of things around here. And you meet them and they do it. Hmm. And I have this, I, I, you probably do too, with certainly wild animals, I freeze. Yes. Because I don't want to do the wrong thing back. And usually they will stop. And then we can start getting into what this was about. And, you know, whether it was surprise or you just trod on my favourite food or something. Yeah. And um, which, unfortunately, I can do without realising it at all. Um, and it really works. Had a bit of that last night because um, Kellen had caught a wood mouse <clears throat> and she decided that chasing it around the room was more fun than biting it and eating it. And unfortunately, it kept going places where I could do nothing about it. And then eventually it came out and it sat in the middle of the floor. So she patted it on the head, at which point I could cheerfully have clubbed her um anyway it sat there so I, I told her to piss off and she glared at me which was fine and i got a, a damp tea towel I, find, I think damp is better than dry because they can push the dry up mm. and just drops it over the little mouse but before that i'd sort of i'd had to go and get the tea towel so i sort of looked at him i said don't move i'll rescue you stay there you'll be safe and his ears did this mm. And so I said it again. So his ears did this again, and he put one, one paw up to his mouth, and then he put it down. And so I was there like reading this sign language that partly was sort of saying, okay, and fuck's sake, hurry up. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and um, anyway, we did, and little mouse went out. He was totally undamaged. Yes. Um, <clears throat> went out in the hedge and it was fine. And I told Kevin to leave him alone. God knows what good that does, Never mind, I tried. Um, but it was really interesting. This, this this was like, you know, well, actually, they went like that. Mm. And um, <clears throat> uh, oh, if, if you do okay, it's like, okay. Yeah. And it was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah I've, had, I've had some interesting conversations with mice in particular. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you'll remember a long time ago, I had a mouse, a pet mouse. Yep. It's yep. a pet. Shorthand. I don't like the word. Yeah. There was a mouse that lived with me called Ginger, yeah. because he was Ginger with white patches, and he developed dermatitis. 
Mm, yes. So I took him to the vet and the vet said, well, I, it's a mouse, I don't have a reason. Just, just wait, it'll probably go away. And if it doesn't, then, you know, this is this mouse is year old, it'll die soon anyway. <laughs> uh, and you sort of go, okay, perhaps I should change vets, but. Yeah, <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> I then sat down and, and sort of sat with Ginger and went, like, I, I hate to see you all scurfy and scruffy and itchy like this. Would you like some chamomile tea? Because it's very soothing for your skin. So I prepared some chamomile tea and let it go lukewarm, not hot, obviously. I thought, well, he might drink it, but then again, he might not. Perhaps he'd like wash and get it on his on his body. So I put it in a dish, and the next thing I know, the mouse is in the dish. Not just drinking it, he's in the dish having a bath. So the next time I made a big pot of chamomile tea and put it in a singing bowl, which mm. happened to be a nice big bowl I had at the time. And, and my mouse was paddling quietly around the bowl, having a lovely time. And it dawned on me that the ripples he was making looked very like the patterns that you get when you wring a singing bowl with water. With water in it. So I very gently rang the bowl. And the mouse went completely still and floated in the middle. Yeah. And I'm like, did I drown him? And then when the ripples died away, he wiggled himself around and paddled straight towards me. And you could see him thinking, do it again, do it again. So I did it again. <laughs> Blissed out mouse in the middle of the bowl. Uh, and it got quite into a, a, a daily ritual that he wanted his bath with sound in front of the fire every day about the morning in chamomile tea. Mm. And we got there between us. I might say his dermatitis cleared up as well. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he got his beautiful soft white coat and he actually went on to live for a couple more years after that, having a cup bath and cup of tea every day. <laughs> <laughs> but we worked that out between us. Yes. And at the time, I mean, this was 25 years ago. Must be, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I remember because we, we yeah. were discussing it at the time. Yeah. I didn't really hear his side of the conversation in words. No. No, you don't. I just got a sense that this would be a good thing to do. Mm. Looking back at it, he, he was talking to me. Yeah. I just didn't have a convenient mental framework to hang that on. Mm. Mm. But even, even without that mental framework, because I was listening, he was able to get through to me. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. But you don't always hear them in words. Well, you may see it, you may hear it, you may sense it. Yeah. You usually don't, at least you don't. Least Mm. I, I then translate it, I'm very yes. good at that, going very fast, so that it comes to words for me because that's easier for me. Mm. But Kellen Cat doesn't talk to me in words, Little Mouse didn't talk to me in words, you know, the bird that I was talking to the other day didn't talk to me in words, but it sort of came whoosh at me. It's a mm. bit like a sort of um, one of those compressed zip files. Yes. And then it's like, open it, zzz, that's what you meant. But it all happens really, once you're used to it, it happens really fast. We then verbalise it back to ourselves because humans are verbal animals. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't come to us as words because other animals are not verbal animals. No. Not the same way. Mm. And they, they do it. And they do it between species too. All yes. with thinking, with thought. Yes. And yes. that's absolutely fascinating with owls. I was out with, um, we've got tawny owls down there. And there's a big oak tree, and I went down for a walk in, in the last full moon. And um, I was under this owl, and he was there, and he was talking. Um, but so I asked him the question I said, Well, don't the mice, mice hear you company, coming then from thoughts? He said, No, I turn it off. Mm. Which Actually, I know how to do because yeah. um, when I first went to London, I was just getting everybody's thoughts on the bloody escalator going down to the tube. And it's like, oh, and it's like, right, I got the off switch, volume down, off switch. And um, apparently animals all have that, particularly, of course, predators, yeah. because they need to, if they're going to eat, they need to say, I'm not here. <laughs> There is also the other side of that, which is sometimes you will find an animal that goes, actually, no, I'm, I'm old, I'm tired, just do it. Absolutely, yes, you do, yeah. And then you come back to very ancient human traditions where you say, thank you for sacrificing yourself that I can live. Yeah. 
Yeah. Of course, owls don't do that. They know it anyway. <laughs> um, well, no, I don't know. I mean, it's difficult when it's very, very wet winter uh, for barn owls because mm. they they will they die of starvation. They do. They they drop in droves and. Bad and some of them apparently drop and die before they're actually at the starvation level. Mm. And that's sort of like, hmm. Yes. You know, okay, all that one. Yes. But there's an, there's an old, um, it certainly works in North American, more than one tribe tradition, apparently. The old person, when you, you knew it was your time, <clears throat> you just went for a walk in the woods. Mm said goodbye to everybody and walked off into the woods and the predators will take care of it and you just sat there yes and left and sometimes they said they, they just left yes you know and there was a body left but um but certainly the predators would otherwise take care of it. and they certainly take care of the remains yes which is quite handy but you you don't as a as a an owl or a bear you don't have to sit down and go thank you for being here for me to eat you no. Because it's all done straight over, I thought. Exactly. It's only humans who've turned the off switch off a little too permanently who have to go, thank you, and yeah. verbalise it. Yeah. But then we're, we're just verbal animals. And the more you practised you get, the more you find you're, you're doing it anyway. You don't actually have to go through the verbal process. Mm. You know, like when we, when we come to a gate or something, when we know we've got to ask if we can go in, go into a circle or something. And um, it's just like, right. Yes. You said, just as you're coming up to it yourself. Well, you send out uh, yeah. whatever it is and say, may I? Yeah. And then you get their thread comes back and says, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's not words again. It's just. No, it's just the thought of the, 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 the intention of may I then. Yes. And the intention comes back. Yeah, come in or no, piss off, I'm busy. Yes. Which one does get occasionally too. Yes. Um, uh, I will verbalise it if I feel formal. Hmm. Oh yeah, and when you're teaching or with other with students or something yes. who haven't done it before, it's much easier if you slow it all right down. Yes. You know. Which you can't see mm. if you've just done the, the thought exchange. Yeah. The students not going to see that. You, they might, but it, it's not worth the risk. You. No. Slow it right down. They'll tell you if that was too slow for you, for them. Mm -hmm. And they, all oh, right, I got it. Mm -hmm. right, okay, tick on that one. Yeah. Um, but don't assume that they're going to get it, kind of. Yeah. Um, going back to the weird, this is why I say, I don't like to tell people you will perceive this. Yeah. Because they might not. Yeah. They, may, they may not. Yeah. They may to begin with and then change it to something else. They may come to that later after seeing it or perceiving it or sensing it in some other way. Yeah. Yeah. So we all have to live in our own realities. Mm. Mm. Are we weird enough? I think we're probably weirded enough for one day. I think we're weirded. We've done the weirding way for you. Yeah. A quote yeah. from a favorite book. <laughs> I shall bring in a quick plug, which is the Animal Shaman's course is starting any day, so get your orders in now. Yes, please. You, you want to you want to join? Mm. And the other one is, of course, the Advanced Runes course is starting soon. Yeah. So if you've done one of my Runes courses, feel free to get in touch and ask to join in. Mm. And if you haven't, sign up for one of the introductory courses. Yeah. You really do need the introductory course first. Mm -hmm. it, yes. It, it will be too confusing if you try to dive straight into the. The, the, introductory, the introductory courses are where you get to know the rooms. Yeah. And get and to know how course, to work with them for yourself. The advanced course, you and the rooms work together to go further. Yeah. But you've got to forge that in, that relationship to the rooms first. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. And now, remind me, with the animal shamanism, if, if I didn't, I mean, I, I can't because I just don't have the time. But if I wanted to sign up, um, have I got to sign up before next Sunday um, or can I sign up anytime? You can actually sign up anytime. It's not tied to the, the cycles of the year. That's fine. I just happen to be starting it in the next few days. So if you want to do it now, yeah. now's the time. Yeah. If you want to save up and start next month, that's fine or in six months or whenever. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and, drop and, email and I will get back to you with when and how. And get on to um, the Deer Trots Tribe website and look under advanced courses and there you will see it. As and we will also see the rooms courses there. Good, yeah. I knew the other one. I knew the first one was, but the advanced rooms course is up there too. Yeah. Well, I have two basic rooms courses, one for the elder food up, the Norse food up, mm. and one for the Anglo-Saxon, which is a later one with an extra eight signs in it. Mm. So some differences in meaning. So you can do either of the courses and then go on to the advanced one. If you're really ambitious, you can do both of them and then go on to the advanced one. Or you could do one and then the advanced and then come back to the other one. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, get on Dear Trolls Tribe and look under advanced courses and you will see them. And um, they are available now. You can yep. sign on now. Yes. Um, none, of the, none of the room courses are tied to time either. Yeah. So, so it's up to you. You work in your own time. Yes. Okay. Right. Let's weird off then. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody.